Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in. Now, we're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And yesterday, by the end of the broadcast, we were discussing Pope Pius IX, early in his pontificate, was somewhat amenable to some of the liberal tendencies that were arising in his realm and sought to make some concessions, but that something happened. And that something is that the Jesuits asserted themselves and redirected Pope Pius IX, as they are so wont to do throughout history. That's right, the Jesuits control the papacy, and they were the ones who granted the papacy this so-called infallibility in order to better consolidate the power of the Roman Catholic Church and reduce their need of influence, that is, the Jesuits' need of influence, in just controlling the Pope rather than the, the, the College of Cardinals and all the so-called hierarchy. Yes, the Jesuit bit was placed in the mouth of the head of the horse, Pope Pius IX, and now the Jesuits can easily steer the papacy. Now, Pope Pius IX at this time took an abrupt turn. No longer was he amenable to any quote-unquote liberal tendencies. But he had previously made some concessions, or was considering making some concessions. And it says, uh, beginning on page uh, 197, if you're following along, about halfway down the page, it says some of his enemies accused him of insincerity in making these uh, uh, concessions and insisted that they were the result of his fears of personal violence. In other words, he was making a compromise to prevent violence from breaking out in his realms. And it says, however this may have been, he was soon turned from his liberal course by events which seemed to have thrown him into the arms of the Jesuits and to have placed him in their direct antagonism to the European liberals of his own church. He took a very, very conservative stand as a result of the uh, effects of uh, the influence of the Jesuits and he turned on those liberal sects of the, of the Catholic Church. And it says, This cunning and compact order, speaking of the Jesuit order, has succeeded in indoctrinating his mind so thoroughly with their ideas of ecclesiastical and civil policy that the remembrance of what he was once, once disposed to do in behalf of the popular representation seems, under their teaching, to have driven him in in the other extreme. So we see this immediate uh, about face by the papacy under the influence of the Jesuits. No liberalism. Strict, ultramontane Jesuitism. That is, the Pope is supreme, the Roman Catholic Church is the only legitimate church in the world, and it has a divine right to rule the world, both temporally and spiritually. That's Jesuitism. And in order for that to happen in the world, liberalism, which is equated to mean Protestantism, must be thoroughly routed. You can't, they can't live together. Catholicism and Protestantism, by the view of the Jesuits, cannot live together. All right. Pope Pius IX's assumed infallibility brought about by them, that is, the Jesuits, has not exempted him from either ambition or passion. He has taken a special pains not only to condemn and anathematize the Italian people, remember he condemned them because they shirked off his temporal throne and accepted Victor Emmanuel as their leader, and uh, began their their own independent government, a government uh, uh, not under papal control. And it says, uh, He has taken a special pains not only to condemn and anathematize the Italian people because they have established their national unity 
and fix their capital at Rome, but attributing these political changes to the motive on their part of ultimately creating liberal and popular institutions, he has so frequently and strongly expressed himself on these subjects that it is not at all difficult to demonstrate his hostility to such, to such a government as ours. All right, seeing how Pope Pius IX hated the liberal government, the rebel government of Italy under Victor Emmanuel, we now know how Pope Pius IX viewed our government. Because on the technical issues, there's no difference. The government of the United States was a popular government, a popular a government of, by, and for the people. The people were the power in the United States. And that's how the Pope saw this new government in Italy, and he took every effort to destroy it. Now, it says, nowhere, however, has he done this more strongly than in the encyclical and syllabus of 1864, which renders it necessary for us to examine their principles minutely in order to see what he requires of his followers in this country, what particular principles of our government have excited his hatred, and what other principles he and his ad adherents propose to substitute for them. The reader should keep in mind, however, that both in the condemnation of one class of principles and the avowal of the other, the Pope is acting within what he, dis what he considers the spiritual order. Okay, we're talking about temporal things, but the Pope considers it part of his spiritual realm. He says, thereby, he may see what temporals he includes in that order, and over what and how many principles of our government he claims jurisdiction on account of his divine commission. And this will enable him to understand what the papal writers mean when they talk about the spiritual and the temporal orders, that is, that those matters only which do not concern the church are temporals, that all matters which do concern the church, either directly or indirectly, are involved in spirituals, and that the Pope has sole and exclusive jurisdiction over these. The encyclical, Pope Pius IX's encyclical, sets out by denouncing, quote, the nefarious attempts of unjust men who promise liberty while they are slaves of corruption, unquote, and who are endeavoring, quote, by their false opinions and most pernicious writings to overthrow the foundations of the Roman Catholic religion and of society, assuming that the superstructure of good government can rest upon no other foundation than the church of which he is the head. These defenders of political liberty have stirred up a quote-unquote horrible tempest, says Pope Pius IX, by their quote-unquote erroneous opinions, which has compelled him to raise his pontifical voice and condemn, quote, the most prominent, most grievous errors of the age, and to exhort all the sons of the Roman Catholic Church in whatever part of the world they may reside that, quote, they should abhor and shun all the said errors as they would the contagion of a fatal pestilence, unquote. The cry went out from the infallible chair of Peter, Pope Pius IX, the vicar of Christ on the earth, that every Roman Catholic must overthrow these liberal, these diabolical tendencies and return under the authority of the papacy. They called, he called liberalism, in a sense Protestantism, a fatal pestilence. These governments that withdrew themselves from the rule by the rich ruling elite, by the kings, 
that were seated by the papacy and set up their own governments were fatal pestilences, according to Pope Pius IX. And it says, proceeding to show what he understands to be the object of these quote-unquote unjust men, he declares that their chief desire is, quote, to hinder and banish that salutary influence which the Catholic Church, by the institution and command of her divine author, capital D and capital A, ought freely to exercise even to the consummation of the world, not only over individuals, but nations, peoples, and sovereigns, unquote. Kind of reminds you of the scriptures, doesn't it? Peoples, nations, tongues, and tribes. The Bible speaks of this monopoly, this monarchy called the papacy in the world. God calls it Antichrist. Now, after thus generalizing, he advances to specific allegations. This is going to be important for my listeners. Listen, he says he considers it impious and absurd that society should be constituted and governed irrespective of religion, and that no real difference should be recognized between true and false religion, that is, that the separation of church and state and the protection of all forms of religion, as in this country, are quote-unquote impious because they violate God's law and absurd because they take away from the papacy the power of governing the country and control the consciences of all the people. He denounces those who insist that governments should not inflict penalties upon those who violate the Catholic religion, thus claiming that governments should be constructed so as to inflict these penalties when the laws of the Roman Catholic Church are violated. Now, what we're talking about here is a union of church and state, where the church makes the laws and the state enforces them with bloody cruelty. We don't need for this to happen again in the world before we realize where the Pope is taking us. All we have to do is look at history. All we have to do is read Fox's Book of Martyrs and so many other books that delineate in bloody detail how the papacy controlled the world. But the papacy wants to restore that old world order. The book continues, he says, the withholding this power of punishment to protect the Roman Catholic religion but no other, he calls a totally false notion of social government, quote, because it leads to the erroneous opinions most pernicious to the Roman Catholic Church and to the salvation of souls, unquote. In other words, the salvation of the world demands that Roman Catholicism be the only religion. He says "These these he calls insanity, following the example of his immediate predecessor, Gregory the Sixteenth, who issued a like encyclical letter in 1832, he then enumerates these quote unquote in erroneous opinions, which are so quote pernicious to the Roman Catholic Church and to the salvation of souls, and which indicate insanity on the part of those who maintain them, manifestly meaning that it is the duty of the papacy to exterminate them wherever it can do so. They are as follows. First, the assertion of the principle that, quote, liberty of conscience and of worship is the right of every man. Second, that this liberty of conscience and of worship should be, quote, proclaimed and asserted by the law, unquote. Third, that the citizen shall have the right to, quote, publish and put forward openly all their ideas whatsoever, either speaking, in print, or by any other method, unquote. Pope Pius IX intended 
that everything spoken, everything written, and by every other means of communication be controlled so that it protected the authority, the unchallenged authority of the Roman Catholic Church and himself. Now, if the Pope could have what he wants today, that's exactly what would happen. And let me give you a little personal experience. I've been talking about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order on amateur radio for about ten years, minus the last six months or more. And why do I not speak about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order on amateur radio anymore these days? Because the truth is being opposed by other licensed amateur radio operators who dislike my communications, who dislike my speech. And they color it hate speech. And they assert that it doesn't belong on amateur radio. And by their own volition, with the support of all their friends, and with the acquiescence, the 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 how should I call it? With the passive acquiescence and support of the Federal Communications Commission and the Amateur Radio Relay League, their jamming of my transmissions is allowed. And word has gotten out that amateurs on the 75-meter band at night who do not like my transmissions, my free speech, my free thought, my free practice of religion, my political speech in regards to the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order, the exact same subjects that I talk about here on First Amendment Radio on Inquisition Update, are not permitted. And they may freely, maliciously, and intentionally jam and interfere with those transmissions to the point where no one can even stand to participate in the discussion. Nobody can stand to listen to it. Government-sponsored jamming of my transmissions. Special Counsel for Amateur Radio Enforcement Laura Smith turns a blind eye and a deaf ear to nightly jamming by innumerable hordes of amateur radio operators. And I assume that she's probably got it in her mind that, well, he's violated the community standard. And what is the community standard? The community standard is ecumenism. That we must not divide Protestants and Catholics anymore, that we seek to unite all Christianity so that we may unitedly fight off this so-called Muslim influence in our government, so that we might not someday have Sharia law imposed here in the United States and that Christianity would be destroyed from off the face of the earth because of this Muslim onslaught. But I dare suggest to the amateur radio community, just as I suggest here on Inquisition Update, that it's not Sharia law that we need to fear. It's not holy prayers of the Muslim faith being echoed all over every neighborhood that we need to fear. It's Roman Catholic canon law. And the, the, the detailed control of thought, speech, and every other mode of communication so that the Pope may rule supreme all over the world. We've been given a boogeyman. They put up Islam as the great threat to Christianity. And the purpose of it all was to unite Roman Catholics and Protestants together. And the object of that was to destroy Protestantism. 
Now, as we continue the reading and discussion of this book, you're going to find out exactly how it destroys Protestantism. In every way, it destroys Protestantism. It destroys even the forms of government that sprang from the liberty uh, achieved by the Protestant Reformation. But this Pope, Pope Pius IX, designed to take away liberty of conscience and liberty of worship. And just like Robert John Newhouse on the set of EWTN during Pope, Pius, uh, Pope Benedict XVI's visit to the United States in 2008, and I've quoted him several times, I'm sorry if this is repetitious, but for the new listeners, he said, no man has the right to choose his own religion. No man has the right to choose what he will believe. Now, that was said live on EWTN, the Roman Catholic Channel, on World Over Live by Raymond Arroyo during the Pope's visit. He reiterated what Pope Pius IX said in his encyclical. No man has the right to choose his own religion. No man has the right to choose what he will believe. That must be dictated by the Pope as the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. No, relig no freedom of religion, no freedom of conscience. In the new world order, there will be no freedom of religion and no freedom of conscience. And that the laws of the Roman Catholic Church will be, will be enforced by law, just as it was during the old world order. And there won't be anything published in this country that runs contrary to the decrees of the Pope. Every mode of communication will be controlled, even as it is on amateur radio, against my discussions of the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. Now, I'll continue with the book. It says, all these principles are essential fundamentals in our form of government and they could not be destroyed without the immediate overthrow of all of our civil institutions. That's right, the new world order cannot be imposed in this country without the immediate overthrow of both our, con our Constitution and our civil institutions, because they're all based on a people-oriented government rather than a kingly-oriented government. Now, yet the Pope declares that they are, quote, pernicious to the Catholic Church, that is, in conflict with its principles and the plan of its organization, that we are insane because we maintain them and consider them worthy of special denunciation and anathema. He declares that those who do maintain them, as all do who are worthy of American citizenship, quote, preach the liberty of perdition, unquote. That's right. Right here on Inquisition Update, I'm preaching the liberty of perdition, according to Pope Pius IX, and according to his faithful Roman Catholic worshipers who jam and interfere with my transmissions on amateur radio while the Federal Communications Commission turns it's deaf ear and blind eye and allows it to continue, not for a little while, but for 10 years. Pope Pius IX said people like me preach the liberty of perdition, warning God's people about the restoration of the old world order is preaching liberty of perdition. Exercising my freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of opinion, freedom of expression to warn God's people about what the papacy plans for this country and the world is exercising a liberty of perdition. In other words, a liberty of hell. And anyone else who does is as equally guilty as I. And if, if people say that that 
Oh, Tom, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. We don't have control of the press. Well, let me ask you. If there's no control of the press, there's no control of speech in this country, then why aren't you hearing anybody talk about the papacy and the civil power on the mainstream media? Or, for that matter, in the churches, in the 501c3 government agent controlled churches. That's right, there's certain things you're not allowed to talk about. Why is not this book being read in all the churches? Why is not this book liberally found on the shelves of the schools of this country? And people dare tell me why we have no control. Of, there's, the press is not controlled in this country. You're a conspiracy theorist, Tom. No, I'm talking about real history. I'm talking about copious, voluminous history. I'm talking about a characteristic of history that dominates history. The papacy is one of the gr main constituents of history. And when God rewinds the tape after this diabolical system has ended and shows all of God's people how the papacy fulfilled its prophetic and historic role as Antichrist in the world, when that tape is replayed, everyone will see for themselves. But the papacy has not been entirely secret. Here we have a papal encyclical damning Protestantism. Their freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom to worship God and to read the Bible for themselves, he called a liberty of perdition. Now, if that isn't Antichrist, I don't know what it is. Now, R.W. Thompson continues, he says, What do the followers of this imperious despot, the Pope, mean by telling us that it is alone by a religion which has such principles and doctrines as these graft into its profession of faith that our government is to be saved from destruction? We understand well enough that the Pope, what the Pope means. It is to declare that in no Roman Catholic government could such pernicious principles exist, that the anathemas of the church are resting heavily upon them, that they are therefore sinful in the eyes of God and accursed in His sight, and that it is the imperative duty of all Roman Catholics in the United States and elsewhere to make immediate war upon these principles and to continue it until all of them are destroyed. Will the priests obey? Undoubtedly they will. Will the layman also? Will you, Charles? That is the question. Time alone will decide it. But Pope Pius IX shows his design still more fully by doing a step further, a striking more directly at the question of popular sovereignty, without which no popular form of government can stand. This he does by enumerating two other errors in which he mingles religion and politics together, showing that he promulgates a political religious don't 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 let your tongue stumble over this word political religious that is in other words a church state or a state sponsored church, political being state and religious being the church. He seeks to promulgate a political religious faith. First, he denounces the idea that the will of the people manifested by public opinion can ever become the law of a country independent of the divine and human right, that is, independent of the divine sanction which God has conferred upon him the right to give or withhold as he pleases. Second, he denounces also the doctrine that in political affairs, accomplished or consummated facts can have the force of right by the fact of accomplishment, meaning thereby that no government which he, as God's vicegerent, 
considers unjust can become legitimate by the fact of its existence for any length of time. And consequently, that the government of the United States, being founded upon principles, quote, pernicious to the Roman Catholic Church and to the salvation of souls, unquote, has not yet become legitimate and would not become so, though it should ex exist a thousand years. He shall hereafter see, we shall hereafter see how this same doctrine is put forth by the highest authorities of the Roman Catholic Church in this country in a more argumentative but not less dogmatic manner than we shall come to consider the modes contrived by the papacy to release the Roman Catholic citizens of the United States from his oath of allegiance to our national constitution. And look, if you think this is unbelievable, this has happened many, many, many times throughout history. And we talked about one example being Austria and Germany. The papacy relieved the people from any allegiance to their government. Any allegiance that they had sworn to their government was null and void and that they were to make war upon their governments to reinstall the papal order of things. Rule by divine right. Get rid of their presidents and their constitutions and their liberal Protestant ideas and put the rich ruling elite back in place. The kings of the earth over which the Pope controls. The divine right rulers who dominate all of history. Now, considering his task yet unfinished, the Pope continues, referring to the religious orders, to the right of the Church to acquire and hold property without limitation, and to socialism and communism, with which he has invariably classed all struggles of the people for self-government. He hurls his most fearful and terrible, ana uh, terrible anathemas at the heads of all who require the Roman Catholic Church to obey the laws of the state, and those who deny the authority of the Church and his own authority over secular affairs. These, he says, and let the reader, keeping in mind the character of our civil institutions, mark well his words. These, quote, presume with extraordinary impudence to subordinate or put down the authority of the Roman Catholic Church and of his apostolic see conferred upon it by Christ our Lord to the judgment of the civil authority and to deny all the rights of the same church and this see with regard to those things which appertain to the secular order. In other words, he damned any notion that any secular government in the world could have any say whatsoever over the church or the pope. Now, he reaffirms the constitutions, as they are called, because they are considered as having all the solemnity of law of his predecessors, Clement XII, Benedict XIV, Pius VII, and Leo XII, which, among other things, condemn all secret societies, and especially Freemasonry. And boy, I could go into a big deal on Freemasonry, but it's not the scope of this book. But in any case, the papacy was against all secret societies, including Freemasonry. And I'll just cut it short by saying he didn't want the Roman Catholic laymen belonging to these secret societies, because if they did belong to these secret societies and went to their secret meetings they might see a cardinal or a bishop or a priest participating in this diabolical order called Freemasonry because the Jesuit order controls Freemasonry. But nonetheless, at this time, the papacies were against Freemasonry. And I've just told you why. Because they control it. The Roman Catholic hierarchy controls these organizations, and they don't want the Roman Catholic laity to know about it. Okay. He denounces those who deny to the church the right to bind the consciences of the faithful in the temporal order of things 
Oh, excuse me, I missed a sentence here. Let me let me start over at the beginning of the, of the uh, paragraph. He reaffirms the constitutions as they are called because they are considered as having all the solemnity of law. Of his predecessors, Clement the Twelfth, Benedict the Fourteenth, Pius the Seventh, and Leo the Tenth, which among other things condemn all secret societies and especially Freemasonry and brand with their heaviest curses their followers and partisans. He denounces those who deny, who deny to the Roman Catholic Church the right to, quote, bind the consciences of the faithful in the temporal order of things, unquote, and also those who say, quote, that the right of the Roman Catholic Church is not competent to restrain with temporal penalties the violation of her laws, unquote. He declares it to be a heresy to say that, quote, the ecclesiastical power is not, by the law of God, made distinct from and independent of the civil power, unquote, and insists that it is not usurpation, but consistent with the divine plan to maintain that it is both distinct and independent. He characterizes those as audacious who assert that his judgments and decrees concerning the welfare of the Roman Catholic Church, its rights and disciplines, quote, do not claim acquiescence and obedience under pain of sin and loss of the Catholic profession if they do not treat of the dogmas of faith and morals, unquote, whereby he means that his judgments and decrees concerning the welfare, rights, and discipline of the Roman Catholic Church are binding upon all the faithful, whether confined to faith and morals or not. In other words, that his infallibility is absolute upon all subjects which he may think proper to embrace within it. That's right. He even decides who comes under his authority. And the Church... The Roman Catholic Church, says Archbishop Manning, quote, is its own evidence, unquote. And the Catholic World, a Roman Catholic pub publication widely dispersed in this country, immediately repeats the idea, quote, the Roman Catholic Church accredits itself, unquote. The Pope, therefore as the infallible head of the church is alone competent to declare the limits and character of his own power. This again, says Manning, quote, is a personal privilege, unquote, which all the combined authority of the church cannot take from him or diminish. There's not a Roman Catholic priest in the United States who does not know that if he dared to utter publicly any sentiment contrary to this, his clerical robes would be stripped off instantaneously and he'd be denounced as fit for the tortures of eternal punishment. The numerous counts in this indictment which the Pope has drawn up against all liberal ideas, all liberal-minded people, and all liberal institution, institutions display no less the malignity of the prosecutor than the skill of a professional adept. He takes care that there shall be no misconception of either the principles or the persons arraigned by it. Therefore, he sweepingly embraces all such as dare to disagree with the Roman Catholic faith by proclaiming that all their teachings and principles are, quote, contrary to the Catholic dogma of the plenary power divinely conferred on the sovereign pontiff by our Lord Jesus Christ to guide, to supervise, and govern the universal church, unquote. And then, folded in his pontifical robes, with his ecclesiastical sword in one hand and his temporal sword in the other, and with the crown of a king yet resting upon his royal brow, he thus hurls at all these impudent and audacious adversaries his fearful curses in one breath and his stern command to the faithful in the next. Here's what he said, quote, Therefore do we by our apostolic authority reprobate, denounce, 
and condemn generally and particularly all the evil opinions and doctrines specially mentioned in this letter, and we wish that they may be held as reprobated, denounced, and condemned by all the children of the Catholic Church." Unquote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is a declaration of war. I don't see how it could be interpreted any other way. Now, I'm accused by Roman Catholics of dividing Protestants and, and the Roman Catholic Church. But what has the Pope just done? He has denounced Protestantism as reprobate, and he condemns them, all their opinions, all their doctrines, and all their institutions, and that they are to be held by every Roman Catholic as reprobated, denounced, and condemned. Now, if it could be said that I'm trying to divide Protestants and Catholics, trying to divide, quote-unquote, Christianity, why doesn't Pope Pius IX come under that same condemnation when in 1864 he issued this encyclical to all Roman Catholics to hold every Protestant, every Protestant idea, and every Protestant institution as damned, as condemned, denounced and condemned, and what does that inherently mean to every Roman Catholic? That they are to just to go about saying, well, you're condemned, you're condemned, you're condemned, or are they going to take over the government? I mean, you can't just pay the Pope lip service. You have to act on your faith, don't you? I mean, it's, it, Pope, the Pope doesn't require anything more of his followers than Christ requires of his followers. You can't go around paying Jesus Christ lip service and serving the devil your whole life. You, don't, you can't fool men by doing that, let alone Christ. You've got to act on your faith. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about a works gospel here. I'm talking about true faith. If you've got true faith, it'll show, won't it? You'll know them by their fruits. So what are the fruits of these Roman Catholics who are sitting into the sitting under the instruction of their Pope, Pope Pius the Ninth? They're going to take over our Protestant institutions. They have taken them over. They've not only taken over the press, they've taken over the churches. The ecumenical movement now dominates the so called Protestant churches. And now we have one, quote-unquote, Christianity. And if Christ were here, he'd spew them out of his mouth. I'm acting on my faith in Christ alone by condemning the Roman Catholic Church and its Pope as Antichrist and the evangelic belly churches that are uniting with this whore of Rome as sharing that office of Antichrist with her. And I do it at great personal expense and pain and persecution. And it has affected my bottom line, which really wasn't very big to begin with. Persecuted wherever I go by Catholics and Protestants alike. But I continue. Because it's the truth. And if not heeded, my warnings, if they're not heeded, if the warnings of R.W. Thompson are not heeded, if the warnings of the Bible are not heeded, if the warnings of history are not heeded, this once Protestant land will become a smoking hole in the ground when Christ returns. But before that happens, a whole lot of good, honest, sacrificing, 
selfless, altruistic, Bible-believing Christians with the truth on their lips will go up in flames or their heads will roll off the guillotine because the papacy's not yet done killing God's people. The new world order is the restoration of the old. And who died then? Bible believers. R.W. Thompson continues, he says, But the Pope is not yet content. His work is not yet accomplished. He next turns his attention to the free discussion of the press, to the pestilent books, pamphlets, and journals which distributed all over the world deceive the people and wickedly lie, and directs his Roman Catholic clergy to instruct the faithful that all true happiness of mankind proceeds from our august religion, from its doctrines and practice. He condemns them to inculcate the doctrine that kingdoms rest upon the foundation of the Roman Catholic faith and not to omit to teach that the royal power has been established not only to exercise the government of the world, but above all, for the protection of the Roman Catholic Church, and that there is nothing more profitable and more glorious for the sovereigns of states and kings than to leave the Roman Catholic Church to exercise its laws and not to permit any to curtail its liberty. Herein adopting the language of Pope St. Felix in a letter written to the Emperor Zeno. And he quotes approvingly from an, an encyclical letter of Pope Pius VII in 1800. This sentence, quote, It is certain that it is advantageous for sovereigns to submit their royal will according to his ordinance to the priests of Jesus Christ and not to prefer it before them. And here... Our analysis of this extraordinary encyclical letter of Pope Pius IX might end if it did not possess additional significance which is concealed from the ordinary reader, whether Catholic or Protestant. The hierarchy understand it perfectly if they were addressed by the Pope in Kabbalistic words, they would be furnished with a key to their interpretation. It is far better that an unreasonable, uh, an unreasonable space should be devoted to it than what is hidden within should remain undisclosed and its true meaning unknown. In other words, R.W. Thompson is going to take the space in this book to reveal to you what was cabalistically included in that encyclical that the average Roman Catholic or Protestant would not understand or would miss, but that the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, its priests and bishops, would understand. It embodies, says R. W. Thompson, but without quoting, several of the previous encyclical letters of Pope Pius IX, one in 1846, one in 1854, and another in 1862. Yes, Pope Pius IX was very busy. In that of 1864, or excuse me, in 1846, he denounces private judgment. Here come the thought police. Pope Pius IX, in a papal encyclical, the most powerful document a pope can write, which is infallibly written... Pope Pius IX in 1846 denounces private judgment in the interpretation of scriptures and condemns those who dare rashly to interpret when God himself has appointed a living authority, that is the Pope, the Church, to teach the true and legitimate sense of his heavenly revelation infallibly. What did the Pope Pius IX just do to your Protestantism? destroyed it, lock, stock, and barrel. And that's what they're going to continue to do until Christ returns. 